thank you for coming. Um, so we might start our session soon. And uh, yeah, good time to be here. Uh, thank you for everyone who came in person. <laughs> and thank for the ones joining us through the Zoom. Um, hope you enjoy the session today. My name is Alexandre Faustino. Um, I'll be facilitating the panel. We are following the Economizing the Economy session today. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and the Kulin Nations, the traditional owners of the lands and waters where we're speaking from today. We may respect to their elders past, present and emerging, as well as uh, the traditional land owners of the lands you might be joining us today, uh, reminding that sovereignty was never ceded. The Festival of Urbanism is co-sponsored by the University of Sydney, Henry Halloran Trust and Monash University. Monash Urban Planning and Design. The theme of the 19th Festival of Urbanism is Future Urbanism. In the session today, Economizing the Economy, we will explore alternative economic models and spaces that rethink what our economy will look like in a post-capitalist world and discuss the implications for the future materials and social fabric of cities, inclusively questioning how we might redeem space for a shared and collective production within our existing economic systems. So we have this brilliant uh, panel here today, Anitra Nielsen, Associate Professor and Honorary Principal Fellow at the University of Melbourne. Thanks for joining us. Joseph Noster, Co-Director of These Are The Projects We Do Together and includes SiteWork. And it's great to be here from SiteWorks having this session. Thanks for coming, Joe. And Zhang Ching, practicing radical insurg insurgent planning and PhD candidate at Monash University. Here today also representing the bike shed. Thank you all for coming. Um, at this time, I would like to hand first to Anitra, if you don't mind a short introduction of yourself first. So Anitra uh, <coughs> is an activist scholar interested in post-capitalism and non-monetary economies. Her academic research centers on responding to the global environmental crisis sustainable and affordable housing, social and solidarity economies, community-based participatory environmental management, and Marxian monetary theory and non-market socialism. Um, you might have maybe a roughly 20 minutes, Anitra, but yeah, let's see what you have for us. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm really looking forward to the whole session. Yeah. Um, so I also really like the title, um, Economizing the Economy, because a lot of my reading, observation and research shows that economic activities, the economy or capitalism, is only economic or efficient in monetary terms. Money is the key unit, the universal equivalent in which everything becomes valued in capitalism. And we can't define capitalism without money because in essence, capital is money making more money. So much of my work has been about money, but from a very critical and skeptical perspective. And that's partly because a lot of my other work has been about environmental sustainability. And especially as an activist, I've got a deep concern about issues of social justice. And this led me to the hypothesis that the economy as we know it, the capitalist economy, has no capacity to deliver us social and ecological values. Economic activities are stuck around the dominance of monetary value. Now, this is a really different conclusion than many others who propose alternative economies. Most critics of capitalism propose some kind of different way of using money to achieve a more satisfactory economy, whereas I think we actually need to explore non-monetary economies. In fact, there are many thinkers and activists who are just as sceptical about money, and many are, as you mentioned, non-market socialists. Um, so um, I was involved in co-editing this book, which is about a series of different kinds of non-market socialists, and that book came out about 10 years ago. Um, and then there's this other book, um, which I came out just earlier this year called Beyond Money, a Post-Capitalist Strategy. 
Um, and in there, I bring together my key arguments, um, concluding that we need to dispense with production for trade and trading in order to confront the two great challenges facing us today. In other words, we need to stop calculating what we produce and how we produce it based on money, monetary units in terms of prices. And we need to stop using money as the key way we exchange, that is we, how we access, transfer and distribute goods and services, both in order to reverse the deep and widening socio-political and economic inequalities and growing environmental imbalances caused by human, that's mainly capitalist activities. So here I'll just say that I start beyond money uh, with a couple of chapters showing how money is both a source and generator of these fatal challenges of inequities and unsustainabilities. Then I spend chapter three describing a money-free alternative because I found that one of the hardest things for us to imagine is how we could run an economy without money. Late June, I released a short film on this alternative, which I refer to as Yenemon. And it's not prescriptive, it's just illustrative. And we're going to play it now. Um, and then I'll finish off by talking for another five minutes before we go on to Joe. <laughs> Today, we live in complex, frustrating webs of credits and debt. Producing for trade damages nature, increases carbon emissions, destabilizes weather, and leads to more fires and floods. Markets are wasteful and inefficient, causing social and ecological conflicts and injustice. Capitalism elevates banks, budgeting and prices as it degrades people and nature. Why don't we challenge the system? How about a world without money? A world based on real values, social and ecological values. A world where we co-govern all together deciding what we make, do and get. Imagine a global network of collectively sufficient cell-like communities. Each responsible for the sustainability of the local environs of which they live. Communities of various sizes living within sub-bioregions offering direct efficient ways of fulfilling people's needs, producing locally close to end users. Imagine each diverse, empowered community caring for Earth, organized horizontally, relatively autonomous, and seamlessly networked globally. We have personal property, but no private property. 
the entire earth is commons with clear and universal principles for commoning, sharing land through secure and fair use rights. We all contribute a set amount of time to collective production. In return, all our basic needs are met. Each household guesstimates their basic needs annually. Working groups report on the capacity of the local area and the capability of locals to fulfil these various needs. We all plan how we will create and care for things and together decide who gets what. Then we work and monitor and tweak how to fulfil those orders all year round. Once established, planning mainly relies on updating previous calculations and taking account of seasonal, natural factors. We produce, say, corn, apples, solar electricity, potable water and clothes for particular, already specified people. This is production on demand. We don't need money or markets. Every service or thing created goes to those who ordered them. We discuss and negotiate compacts to produce for and to receive from neighbouring or more distant communities those goods and services that we cannot find or make locally. We don't overconsume or go without or waste. We pass on or leave things that we don't need in spaces for others to use them. We have collective stores for emergencies and to fill unforeseen gaps. So production for trade, markets and money are replaced with local decision making direct production on demand and distribution on the basis of need. Decision making focuses on diverse, real, biophysical, ecological and social measures and values. The reward for contributing to collective daily tasks is lifelong security of communally meeting our and Earth's basic needs. We engage together respectfully to make decisions on local production and on the terms of exchange compacts with producers beyond our community. Real social and ecological values offer the democratic and materialist terms for replacing money as the organising principle of society. Collectively satisfying everyone's basic needs, we would fulfil our real human potential as creative, active beings with real freedom, real liberation, real power. in my book. Are you right? We, and um, that chapter shows um, how we can replace money with co-governance of production and distribution that's based on commoning, satisfying everyone's basic needs, no more, no less, and by caring for earth. 
As mentioned in the film, real values come in here because all decision making is based on real, social, and ecological values. So I call that real valueism, and I call myself a real valuist. The other five chapters are much more about transitioning to money, money free economies, um, where we can have a much greater say over what we will all collectively produce and consume. So chapter four is on environmental problems that monetary economies pose, such as carbon offsets and carbon trading to control carbon emissions. So I draw on work by philosophers, politicians and environmentalists to show what environmental movements might gain by adopting instead a money-free vision. And chapter five is on women's liberation, values and money, because women's involvement in care work is, has always posed essential economic challenges and revealed how odd and partial paid work is. There's another chapter on how much certain Indigenous people's approaches can offer in terms of money-free economies. And the one on technology asks, all the kinds of questions around the roles of sophisticated technologies in capitalist accumulation and its attraction as a magical solution to all problems. That chapter draws a lot on degrowth, which is um, a movement that I've been very involved in. Um, and we can talk about degrowth later. But that's another book that I've been um, involved in co-authoring. Um, suffice to say here that in fingering growth as a key weakness in capitalism, degrowth advocates also have to confront that we actually can't grow in a monetary economy, or de that is rather, we can't degrow in a monetary economy. Um, so capitalism's operating systems are always based on growth. So there's a lot to discuss here, but I'll just confine my last couple of minutes to cities. Um, so especially in recent years associated with concerns over unsustainable practices, there's been very infectious arguments around cities economizing on carbon emissions due to dense living and you know, casting rural areas as um, being less sustainable. But again, I'm actually very um, skeptical and critical of those kind of claims. Cities rely on vast hinterlands to sustain them. And many cities such as Melbourne really sprawl out eating up otherwise productive land with settlements causing deforestation and wreaking havoc on natural waterways and landscapes more generally. The citizens in cities have very few options also, but to be cogs in the wheels of money making more money. Still, many living in urban areas do recognize such challenges and close living gives great opportunities for people wanting to discover new ways of honoring earth, becoming more sustainable and sociable, what degrowth is called conviviality. So to hear more about these initiatives. I'm going to pass on to Joe. <laughs> that was an excellent pass. Thank you, Rand. The, um, I'm going to borrow both of these books. Um, <clears throat> hi, uh, my name's Joe Norster. And um, uh, with, uh, do you want to do an intro of any description or I can do it myself? You can I can make up my own. Yeah, I said thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for um, coming this evening. And uh, uh, Millie Catlin, my partner in crime, uh, has an apology this evening um, for many of the kind of uh, unmonitored um, uh, child raising requirements that you get with a one year old. Um, uh, otherwise, she'd be just crawling around, which we would should be exactly where she is. But anyway, um, so look, I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about the lived experience of alternative uh, economies and uh, illustrate those by talking specifically about uh, a project that we'd run here at SiteWorks. Um, who's is anyone not been to SiteWorks here? Just like, is everybody been here at some point? You haven't been here? Okay, just, just interested in the familiarity of the site and its, its sort of operations. Um, 
SiteWorks is a is one of the projects. Testing Grounds is another uh, project which was in the Arts Precinct, which is about to move. And the third one is uh, an umbrella or satellite project that we're working in Coburg at a local high school. Um, so I guess the the ideas about demonitoring an environment um, really came about by us trying to subvert some of the requirements for a project we started working on uh, in South Bank for Creative Victoria in 2013. So this was an environment where a, an old vacant block of land that had been vacant for close to 20 years, um, uh, the policy, uh, there were some policy people in the, in the um, uh, infrastructure team who were looking at ways of trying to activate this site, to try and do something on this site. Um, there was no funds available for active programming. There was no way to pay anyone to make work on that site. It was kind of like quite a strict regime of exactly what you would be able to do with that. So our response was to kind of subvert the idea of what that creative enterprise might be. And we took what was in essence the maintenance budget for that site. And we decided to use that to program the site by us then actively engaging with the site and to some extent becoming urban farmers like I, and I, I think there's elements of an agrarian economy and a, and a, and a non-monetary economy that I think has really filtered into a lot of the way we respond to urban science so we've got a 2,000 square meters of, of overlooked land right in the arts precinct um, and we basically turn it into an, a, an agrarian kind of economy. People are arriving on the site. They're not paying to use the site. We're not paying them to be there. Um, and there is a direct exchange of their time for space. And we learned a lot through that. It wasn't an intentional proposition. We didn't set out to set up this scheme of, of an exchange for time for space. It evolved through many iterations and, and, and ways of understanding what artists and creative practitioners really needed and the fundamental hey well sorry hey Liam um, <laughs> um, the fundamental the fundamental thing that we understood and what we really got from the feedback from artists that were using the site was they needed us to get the hell out of the way they needed time and they needed space the notion of additional funding in cash or in kind was often secondary to what they needed. They had the impetus to do it. They wanted us to basically find a space and find a way to do it. What was unusual about uh, the testing grounds model in its early form was that there was no cost to use it. Often if you're trying to use any space anywhere at any time, you're going to have to pay for it at some point. Um, especially in, in, a, in a large city context. So it was an unusual model in that artists could come, they could explore, there was no time limit. Artists would reiterate, they would come back again and again and learn from their time on site. Whilst we were developing this project within the arts precincts, we were looking at this site in Brunswick, which became SiteWorks. And, Will um, was interested in ways that we could, a, a group of people could transform what was an old school site into uh, a transitional site that could take creative um, uh, practice. And in its very broadest kind of terms, a lot of, uh, I guess a lot of adaptive reuse projects focus highly, uh, focus on arts practice but we were really interested in design, philosophy, uh, a range of desktop practices that could then come into this site. Um, getting access to the site, leveraging into the site was something that we had to work on. And the way we did it was to basically not change its use. So we're really interested in this site becoming and maintaining an educational focus. It was a school, it's set up as a school, uh, it screams institutional kind of trauma, but you know there are there are ways that you can work around that. And I think that the us seeing the capacity for a building fit for purpose in the exchange, and we took education to mean the exchange of information and knowledge in its broadest kind of sense, um, 
allowed us to consider a different approach to the site with a limited budget and with a lot of time in our hands one of the things that we thought that we could do was set up what we called a contra exchange model which was to uh, through an expression of interest process invite a wide range of people who would in exchange for space provide their time and specific skill set um, it's not a new model it's been done before um, the, the first attempt in this was to establish what we called a think tank or became the Moreland Will, remind me? Civic Lab. Civic Lab, sorry. <laughs> um, became the Moreland Civic Lab, which I think is a more palatable kind of term, but we like think tank just because of its, you know, um, you know it's dangerous American ideas. The, 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 the think tank, was a group of individuals that were to establish themselves in the old house, which is in the middle of the site. And they were to exchange free office space for their ability to think about public space, to think about the transformation of a civic building, to think about how this might be used, and then to report back and report back to us or report back to council. So there was a, uh, a sophistication to the reporting process that I think we really enjoyed. Um, it failed terribly. Like it was a dismal failure in regards to, in regards to having substantial, substantial outcomes. But what was really successful about it was that we saw that there was a desire for uh, a, a community to really engage with the way a place changes, to have a say in that change. Um, and that, there are things, there are mechanisms in exchange beyond money, beyond financial exchange that were really important to them. And it was one thing that, and this we struggled with a lot, was to how to quantify the value of the exchange. Because we can do net lettable area as a square meterage rate, and that has a dollar value. And we can do an hourly rate. So you can say, well, it 75 or 120 or 300 dollars an hour i can exchange this lettable area for that amount of money and we were really keen to avoid any notion of that and it was very much space for time so it was two hours a week were to be given over in exchange for the space so your value was two hours it wasn't a dollar figure we thought that was really important People who came into the program and looked at the program were really keen to understand, well, my hourly rate is this. So is the value of the space then that? And we were like, you can't, you cannot think of it like that. Um, I clean the toilets at five o'clock in the morning. I should be getting paid $28 an hour. So what, what's the value of that time? So that was a really kind of important lesson that we learned about the the discretionary kind of ability for people to choose what their own value is. That contra exchange program developed by then accessing more and more spaces across the site. I think in the end, we had a dozen or more contra exchange programs on the site. Um, design exchanges, thinking exchanges. We've got examples of some of the exchanges in this room where site studio another group of designers went through the site and did deep examination of the site over a long period of time and that feedback was poetic and uh personal um and it was quite a beautiful kind of process its value to any external body is questionable but as as far as culture building was concerned it was remarkable um the contra exchanges are also prosaic and, 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 and practical. So we have contra exchanges that allow for the simple vacuuming of floors, which is an extraordinarily important part of the operation of any kind of civic space, is caretaking, is cleanliness, is cleaning. And that ritualized kind of care of a site is something that we've really encouraged. Um, finally, I, I guess um, we've, tried to take this contra exchange model of time for space and uh, insert it into a state government school in Coburg. Lionel Hall is a, is a, I guess, a progressive small government school. 
based in Richmond and Coburg. And they have got space that is underutilized. And we've developed a program in Coburg in an old um, TAFE school that they have up there uh, in exchange for one of their old workshops. And we've put a program of groundskeeping in exchange for space. It's taken a very long time. Um, and the, I think we started it in March 2020, which was a, not the best time to start anything really. Um, and it's only really this year started to really come to fruition. Um, but that's our capacity to kind of push off site and try to develop these programs in some sense independent of us. So they can kind of like be untethered at some point. So we're trying to develop this proof of concept that then can become an independent little entity that can then be replicated anywhere you like. Um, I guess in closing, the, the, this very kind of process that we're in now is a, um, to be, get a bit meta, is it, it is in, in itself a contra exchange. Um, so the, the research lab itself is, is part of that process. And this very moment is part of that. I guess. Yeah, oh my God. Anyway, um, yes. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, look, I think you finished. That's. I think I don't really have much more to add. Um, but yeah, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. So I guess I'll build on what Joe was saying because I was actually part of the Civic Lab initially, um, and. In some ways it was a failure, but some ways it was like a really beautiful failure because it showed um, this idea of like the contra agreement actually working, um, but then being more about, um, yeah, more, more than just like monetary exchange of money and rent, but really about yeah, this culture <laughs> building. And yeah, I, I, I did the Civic Lab experience as part of that. And it was really, really beautiful. Met some fantastic people along the way. Um, and then left it, but then come, came back a couple of years later and, and was like, hey, Joe, we're looking APR, the people hosting this event, uh, are looking for a space. And, and they were like, okay, we'll set you up in one of the lovely rooms up there and we'll do a contra agreement. And I was like, that's great. And so, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's been really beautiful to be part of it. And I think there is something around this sort of caretaking mm -hmm. aspect that you ask in exchange for the rent and, and the time is, to, to take autonomy and control over the space and feel like it is yours. Otherwise we do feel like we are kind of creeping around a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's actually been really lovely. And so, if, you know, I, I see it from the perspective of being on the ground and the relationships and the cultures being built and really value that experience that you've been able to provide in that way and in this space. And not, um, I guess the, oh, I think that, um, that deep, that 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 capacity to remove money from that exchange moment. There's a rely, and one thing that I've I've come to maybe understand is that, and this might come across a bit corny or or, or saccharine, but but you you need to actually fall in love with a place, and it's and it's not something that we do easily or uh, well in a big capital city context. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can be tribal and you can have, I love Brunswick or St Kilda or you, which I think is, is fairly superficial kind of relationship with a place, but there needs to be a moment where you, you have that love affair with this piece of land that you're on and you do feel like there is a direct connection with it. Um, and I don't think that should be diminished at all. One of the major experiences I had through the pandemic was because I wasn't locked down um, for a range of reasons, I could go and maintain places. But going through the CBD, I realised, I had this moment of like, it's demonstrating its irrelevancy. Like there was a real moment of like, it's become irrelevant, you know, mm. and and... It, it, it's screaming to be reoccupied and re-energized, but it was amazingly irrelevant to anybody's actual life on an ongoing way. Sorry. I don't know. Yeah, um, you got your presentation. Does anybody need a drink of water? 
or anything. There's some up the back. The um, yeah, good. Thank you, Akira. No, really, get some water. <laughs> Proper presentation times. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zeng, and I'm here from <laughs> representing the bike shed amongst the other weird things that I have in my life. Uh, well, weird, but also lovely with the APR crew. <laughs> uh, okay, so I figured I was going to stand up and do stuff, but it's a bit awkward with the mic. But uh, but essentially, I was going to say, um, I'm from the bike shed. The bike shed is that series. Has anyone been there before? Yep, Lockie. Yep, Paloma. Obviously, Paloma, you've been there before. Will. Um, so I, I thought today I'd talk through my experience being at the bike shed, um, how it relates kind of to the circular economy, um, and also sort of the practices around um, what people actually do when it comes to these alternative ways of, of being, um, of practicing in the economy. So essentially, uh, what happens is we get lots of bikes that are donated. Um, and a lot of bikes kind of look like this blue one over here. They're pretty kind of beaten up. They've sort of got locks on them that the keys have been lost. Um, and what we do is we go, we grab the bike and we look through it and kind of like start to, um, to get a sense of what's wrong with it and go through that process of fixing it. So ideally, the goal is to, um, to, to fix the bike but that requires a bit of skill, a bit of knowledge, and our aim is to kind of encourage people to develop those skills and knowledge to be able to help fix these bikes. Um, so the goal ultimately is to, um, to prevent them from going to landfill. And so, yeah, and but some bikes can't be fixed, sadly. And so if the bikes can't be fixed, then we have to sort of strip them and we'll keep certain parts. Um, otherwise, um, the rest kind of goes to recycling or to other, um, Landfill as well. Cool. Uh, all right. So the bike is really interesting because it's a space in which you can really experiment, and try different things. And I think the big part of you know reflecting on SiteWorks as well, the big reason of why that's possible is because rent is incredibly cheap. So series have been able to provide very cheap and affordable space for us to operate there. It's like I think it's sort of like six grand a year we kind of pay um, at the shed to be able to use the space, which is fantastic. It's also a non-for-profit and largely volunteer-run organization, which means that people who go there are pretty committed to the space and are really interested in growing it and wanting to learn and develop their skills. Um, so uh, these sort of different factors kind of result in this space, which allows for a lot of experiment and experimentation and testing. Um, so as for me, I joined the shed in 2020 as the manager. Um, previously, there wasn't a manager at the bike shed. And how it worked was people, um, there were a bunch of volunteers. People would come uh, and they would sort of find a bike that they liked working on. So say someone said, hey, I really like this blue bike. That's kind of cool. Can I work on it? And then a, a volunteer would come and work with that person and teach them at the same time of how to fix the bike, how to do certain things how to um, develop those kind of technical skills. And essentially the person at the end of the day would walk away with the bike um, fix and, and have developed some knowledge. Um, the biggest sort of problem with this approach was that a lot of the volunteers would get burnt out because it'd be like you know, 30 or 40 people at the shed wanting to fix bikes at the same time. So it was a very difficult kind of exhausting process. So it took, I guess it took a lot of, toll emotionally and, and caring wise on the labor, emotional labor needed to sort of not only fix a bike, but also teach and educate someone through that process. Um, and so because of COVID, when I joined sort of was raging on, um, we sort of realized we needed to change the model that we currently had. Um, and there's also these kind of interesting discourses around the spaces, um, traditional sort of white male dominated spaces, people who are technically experienced that some people feel excluded from. And I'm, you know, I'm sure some people in the crowd maybe have gone into a bike shop and you often get met with like technical jargon straight away. Someone starts talking about the bottom bracket, the crank set, the blah, 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 blah. And you're just like, 
it, so the bike should previously kind of embodied that way of being. Um, and I noticed that and I, I kind of like wanted to change it because <laughs> I have previously been mansplained before on how to fix bikes and I find it incredibly uh, frustrating. So I was like, we should change this. Um, so we essentially shifted how our model worked uh, for the bike trade. So instead of uh, having volunteers, public come, they pick a bike. What happened was uh, we just had a bunch of volunteers who came and we sort of trained them up um, to learn how to fix bikes. And then we would sell those bikes to the public. And that was sort of how we did things uh, for a while. And the aim was to create a safe space that people would feel comfortable to come and learn without feeling like they were doing something wrong. It was kind of the goal was to encourage, uh, yeah, the act of making mistakes. It was like a lot of people who came didn't know a lot about bikes. Um, and so what we did was we sort of said, if you wanted to fix this bike, go ahead and just have a go because it's not your bike. It doesn't matter if it gets ruined. And so people have felt more comfortable to, you know, take the wheel off, uh, do this, do that, and sort of learn through making mistakes. Um, so ultimately it sort of shifted away from kind of volunteers who have really skilled mechanically to like helping a lot of people to actually about finding a few people who wanted to develop their skills in terms of fixing bikes and really fostering an environment that allowed them to develop that further. Um, and then I guess, cause I also have a bit of a community building side um, it was more than just about developing technical skills, but it was also creating a sense of community. Part of that was like education classes, but also doing activities outside the bike shed, going for bike rides, that sort of stuff. Um, and also at the same time, I was kind of working through like my own issues around identity and my connection to who I was as a Chinese Malaysian uh, person and beginning to realize that there were a lot of spaces out there, sort of, as I said before, that one inclusive to a wide variety of people that live in, in, in Melbourne. Um, a lot of like men's sheds, a lot of bike shops, largely white male dominated and, and they can be really exclusive. So I, I, I really wanted to kind of focus on building a more inclusive environment. Um, eventually I left the shed in 2021 after about a year, uh, just because there were lots of tensions with the committee. Um, I think it was because I sort of wanted to create a vision of the bike shed that maybe was different from their vision. Um, and so that decision sort of, because of these tensions sort of led me to go, okay, I, I can't really deal with this anymore. I need to leave, I need to have my own space. Um, and I think in my mind, it was sort of when you create a big, when you create a nice, a, a good community an inclusive community, it, it can be a way as well to generate sort of economic growth in that traditional sense. We have a lot of volunteers who are giving their time and energy because they really want to build and create this organization. You know, much like SiteWorks, I, we, we love this space and we want to keep growing it because we feel connected to it. And I think that's something that's often missed a lot in kind of traditional, more utilitarian economic thinking mm -hmm. is this little, the, the concept of love in the economy, you know, it's important. Um, but since then, uh, when I was the manager, we, me and a few other volunteers, Paloma being one of them here, um, we work together to run for the committee. And so now we sit on the committee. And so that means we kind of make the decisions around the bike shed. It's a bit of a coup. Uh, and are now working with a new manager, which is really exciting. So thank you, Paloma, for being part of that coup. Um, so I guess I'll sort of wrap up a little bit. Um, but we sort of operate in this idea that we are you know, part of this circular economy. So we intervene by encouraging more repairing, by encouraging more reusing um, and sort of sorting of materials. Um, and it's, it's, and it, it's interesting, like for people who maybe cycle or, or have bikes or, and the kind of spectrum of those who are really into bike culture, you can sort of, sort of see it paralleling with kind of the growth of capitalism where you've got new bikes that are coming out, there's all this new technologies, new gear that kind of makes old bikes redundant. And what it does is creates a sense of consumerism and, and enhances that capitalistic desire to just purchase and buy new things because of the sake of it. But in reality, you know, a bike like this, this old sort of being up blue bike and this sort of slightly newer orange bike, functionally they're the same but it's this weird kind of uh, desire to consume the latest, newest thing, um, which kind of 
as the bike share, that's sort of what we are trying to challenge because a lot of the bikes we get are old donated bikes, but they're actually still really good. And I think part of it is, is giving people skills and knowledge to be able to fix their own bikes so that they feel more connected to them so that should the latest, greatest thing come out, they're a bit more kind of aware of what it is and how kind of pointless it is. Um, and then another thing is, is focusing on values rather than skills for the bike shed. And this links to sort of the importance of diversity and inclusion. Uh, what I mean by that is at the bike shed, there tends to be people who want to come in and, and help others. And they do this, they have this idea that just because they have the skills in terms of mechanically being able to fix a bike, it gives them the kind of authority and right to come into the space and then help other people. But I found that really quite toxic um, and actually preferred people who didn't know anything about bikes and were just like here because they wanted to learn and because they wanted to help others. And I think it's because people who brought those really kind of mechanical expertise and skill set to the bike shed often brought a lot of uh, presumptions around other people's experience of bikes. So, you know, mansplaining, tech, very technical language, um, that sort of behavior I thought was more difficult to change than starting off with someone who had good values and then teaching them how to run bikes. You can, you can teach anyone how to uh, fix a bike. And I think that finding people who, have, who, are, who are kind, who are, who are good active listeners, who are good teachers are harder than teaching someone how to fix a bike. And so that was the approach that I kind of took with the bike shed um, when I was there as the manager. Um, and then I'd like to maybe invite Paloma to talk a little bit about some economy stuff as well, if you would like to. Yeah, Put me on the spot here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I guess my favorite take on the bike shed is how it's a tactical action to produce this long-term change, mm -hmm. especially thinking about economy and the old dependency that we have as in our society. I mean, thinking about this community bike mm -hmm workshop and how the goal as I see it like long term is get people out of their cars have people riding their bikes building community getting those connections to which at the long term can make this large transition into more sustainable societies right and thinking about the the economy and what we do it's not only this um, diverting from landfill, uh, from the bicycles that aren't used and using these new bicycles to build new skills. But it's also, the, I guess the most important thing is this community building uh, that allows this broader connection, not only to place, but how we move around place. And it was really interesting, the video that you showed, Anitra, about this unit, right? And it's also intertwined with what we know as 20 minute neighborhoods. You can have all your um, all your opinions about 20 minute neighborhoods, but what we do in the bike shed is just a tiny action that we can not feel hopeless and and the because in in these long term goals of having cities that we can uh, ride on our bike and. Uh, decrease our carbon footprint and everything like we expect expect policymakers to have to make cycle paths and cycling infrastructure and what we do in early is produce a behavioral shift from the grassroots level and i guess that's uh that's something that we can do and we can achieve and it it's like um if i'm gonna be here at least let's do something that that's worth the while and that's my take on the on, on my personal mission of the bike shed in terms of how we can shift this uh, long term economic pursuits, I guess. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's, that's me, Alex. You wanna? Yeah. Say. Um, maybe Paloma can stay sitting with us and we might just, are we good with the setups there? 
Okay, yeah, better panel here now, even way better. <laughs> so um, for everyone here, person and online, you can start warming up a few questions. We might, oh my God, sorry. <laughs> yeah, my series is popular. <laughs> So if you can, yeah, citing a few questions and you can bring to the panel and we have people monitoring the Zoom that will facilitate as well. And just as a housekeeping thing, as we are doing the hybrid model, when you are speaking from the audience, we'll be sharing the mic. So please make sure you're talking to the mic so who is not in the room can also follow up the conversation that is happening uh, and be patient with that. But it's been a fabulous conversation and a enormous pleasure to be in the panel and I maybe would just as the opportunity add um, how the love that comes also from the work we're doing together in the Alliance for Praxis Research, uh, the group that Zeng participates, Nicholas behind the cameras, Rachel that is also there and Nana who couldn't be today, but I think comes from that same sense of found, finding a community within our PhD journey where we could uh, builds together values in how we can put our work to transform realities where we are inscribed right now as the PhD sometimes can be this a bit isolating theoretically conceptually systemically thinking but then what are we doing in the lands in the cities we are living so missing a bit of that component and also the collective the community the sharing of a journey and APR came from that moment and we've been trying to facilitate more spaces to share uh, our experiences, learn from each other and hold conversations such as this that can inspire us and show possibilities and alternatives. And in the same way, thinking what we can do in our public space with our cities, how we can transform a few things and create encounters, uh, put together people from multiple places and centers and universities. That's so much great potential and passion here in Melbourne that can work together. So yeah, just sharing a bit of APR as well. But um, do we have questions for the panel? There's so much we could unpack from here. Does anybody would like to kick off with? Yes, Declan. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. Um, I was just wondering, so, uh, there was a lot of talk of non-monetary uh, economies and some really great practical experiments of doing that. Um, I was wondering whether you could talk through some of the tensions of trying to layer those non-monetary experiments over what is a very obviously monetary economy. Um, perhaps some practical examples from um, the bike shed and site works, but also I'm interested in the theory as well. Let's go first. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a great question, and the that inherent tension is something that we we saw from the get go. This is a site that we're exchanging money all the time, you know, and we don't pretend we're not. Um, there is a an econ, there is a an economy on this site that operates to maintain it and to provision it and keep the lights on. And, and so there is a, an economy that operates there. Um, and there are labor components, I guess, within the operational team that, that, are, that you would not necessarily see in a uh, cut and dry um, uh, space facility for hire. So there, there, are, there are things, I guess, that that we're bringing to the operation of this site that you wouldn't get from a purely profit-driven environment um, or even a not-for-profit environment necessarily. Uh, I guess what we look to do is, is specifically on this site is to test discrete models. So is to test a discrete space with an exchange and see that in isolation. What we're really trying to do is to then see where that can 
and as we've done with the, the project for Lionel Hall, to be able to then have a, a small proof of concept that can then leave this space and go elsewhere. I think that's kind of our major desire to, to, to have that on this site as a proof of concept. And I think one thing that we see as, as being a success in that is that the future development of this site will have an embedded contra uh, relationship on the site ongoing and I think I think that's a really kind of and with the the um, with the, the blessing and, and with the with the um, support of Mary Beck Council like they are like very seriously kind of they understand that relationship and they're supportive of that relationship and it's Mary Beck as a today five o'clock we're a little bit ahead of ourselves <laughs> I hope that answers some part of it. Um, yeah, so at the bike shed, I mean, we sell bikes to the public, but a lot of the bikes that are fixed are fixed by volunteers like Paloma. Um, and I think, you know, they, you give a lot of time and energy to the bike shed without like this idea of anything in return, even, even if there is a possibility of getting like bike parts for cheaper it's really not an interest of a lot of the volunteers that i've talked to in the past it's really just like because you're working to create a, a common vision a, a common future of something that's better that's and, yet, and giving back to with the skills that you have so that people can have access to affordable bicycles um and yeah so we still partake in a traditional economy and in, in the exchange of money but there are other things which, you know, if, if an economist was to look at our books, they'd go, oh, you're only making this much. But in reality, there's so much work that's being done there that isn't being counted or accounted for. And so, yeah, there's other drivers that are still remain hidden, I think. Um, I guess that has to do with the tension that you explained before with the previous committee that the, the focus of the bike shed was more into selling bikes rather than building community. And when you do that shift, you can give back with people uh, from their time to, okay, I'm also making friends. I'm having meaningful conversations. I'm learning a lot and I'm allowing myself to play a bit with bikes and discover other things like other uh, partnerships, other uh, connections that that people get really surprised when they, they do that. But when the focus is on selling the bikes, you lose that and you lose engagement and the place just feels meaningless. So, uh, on, on my way through, I had a thought where there was a recent um, uh, like artist market that, that we sort of helped produce. And I, I had a moment of realizing just how awkward often that moment is with artists trying to sell something mm -hmm. and 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 I, I spoke to all of our program manager who sort of put this artist market on and I'm like what is that moment that we need to produce prior or after or during that allows that awkwardness to dissolve like what how do you do that mm -hmm. and he's like let's make it that it's no cash exchange like just have it as an exchange mm -hmm. people can just swap and I'm like that's perfect but yeah, they're, they're, it's always inherent in those market, those maker market environments. There's this awkward, fragile kind of moment where, do you like my strange misshapen pot? You know, like, but it is, but it is so exposing to the person who's trying to sell this thing. But if you take away that desire to sell it, where it's you're here for a social engagement to talk to friends and to have some food and to think about the world, and do you like my misshapen strange pot? You know, like at the same time, I think there's sort of. But it's tricky because you still have to pay the rent. Yes. It's a, from a privileged position, right? And that's yes. that's a tension that, that arises really quickly as well. Yeah, I'd like to say uh, one thing that's kind of theoretical, another thing that's more practical. So um, in the literature analyses, um, people talk about these as prefigurative hybrids. <laughs> and what they mean by that is, is, is that people here are trying to get out of the current system and seek something that's in the future. So it's prefigurative in that sense, 
but the tension is in the hybrid because it's in the present, it's situated right here, and you're having to deal with these tensions mm. and envisage and try and act, mm. try and act as if you're in the future and trying to do that. And it's necessarily experimental because we don't know what's going to work in the future. One of the reasons I became really interested in the key fact of money was I felt like you really need to sweep all of that aside. You need to be very conscious that this is one of the big things that's, that's, that's holding everyone back because sustainability studies for a very long time had a kind of triple bottom line at social, ecological and economic. Economic always really ran, you know, one out always you know and what you found is 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 that you know in the whole last 500 years of colonization of the world this is exactly what has happened is is that people have come and said oh yeah we've we've got the money we've you know and this is our private property now we've we've invaded here this is our private property and we do things by trade and that's more efficient and um it's a it's a less primitive way and more civilized to be using money and this disintegrates indigenous ways of working with the land, of, of living in and owning and commoning. And so we've lost a lot and we're all trying to regain it in kinds of ways. The bike shed really um, reminds me of a, um, a, there's a degrowth formation in Budapest um, that, um, I first became aware of in 2006 because there was a um, degrowth, international degrowth conference there. And I went back in 2018 um, because uh, one of the um, contributors to a book that um, I'd co-edited um, on housing for degrowth was there and they, they, we gave talks and they showed us their bike shed. And there... Um, they try to share skills and knowledge as much as possible, you know, so really kind of like, yeah, trying to deal with that challenge that you were trying to unpack mm -hmm. about people having knowledge mm -hmm. and um, that making them more patronizing in the way that they deal with other people. And so very consciously trying to share knowledge, share skills, um, allow it to be an intergenerational kind of space, you know, where you've got young kids learning these things and respecting olders, elderly people who understand these things as well. Yeah. Great press conversation. Um, you have more questions, follow up on that? Okay, so we get got questions from the Zoom and Rachel will deliver us. <laughs> from the digital audience. Please. Yeah, how many we have online? Now? 18. 18, good number. Yeah. <laughs> the Zoom. <yeah. laughs> um, there's a question for all panelists um, from the digital audience. Uh, if you've received any questioning or activism against your projects from neighbors or community. Um, and then within that, a question also specifically for Anitra, um, if you believe community is ready for a no money future in the next five years. Um, so I can, I think I can answer that um, fairly quickly. Look, I think that um, there are different people who are at kind of different levels of having skills and knowledge around what is essentially self-organization and it's self-organization, which it, is at the key of living alternatively and without, um, without money. And so what you have are communities and you have people who are actually very highly skilled in some of these areas, and you have other people who aren't as skilled. And, and I think that it just depends where people are at and how attracted they are how disillusioned they are with the current system and how attracted they are to experimenting with different things and actually having the opportunities that um, different sorts of initiatives like you're involved with actually give people to learn those kinds of things and then move on and inspire them to do similar things elsewhere. 
um, <clears throat> uh, subversive kind of activities from the neighbours? I think that's a great question. Not not in any overt form. I think that 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 some of the practices that happen at site works do challenge. Um, notions of maybe traditional community organization within Brunswick. I think there are there are possibly the diversity of use and the kind of activities that happen at site works might challenge some traditional kind of community organizations in Brunswick um, because there is this uh, alternate economy that is operating on the site, um, which might be, although, yeah, so, but, but nothing overt. Uh, I had a thought, and I, I, someone looked this up if they could, but does anyone use money in Antarctica? <laughs> like, I just had a thought, and, and like, all the International Space Station, if any, someone could research that, that would be really good. Um, but yeah, they're just two questions, because they're two, they might be two really good examples of places that just don't have any money, or no, ex no, no one's pulling a credit card out and going, I need some skis, you know. And? Money, no ships except credit cards and US dollars. Shit, 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 shit. I want to be on the continent of Antarctica. There is actually an Antarctic dollar. <laughs> but if you are not using how do I exchange it? <laughs> if, you, if you're not good at physically in the place, it's like an Antarctic in the space, it's money behind that space. It's, it's not a legal tender. It's not a legal tender. Just for control, we need the mic for people. Oh, sorry, sorry. 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 sorry, to invent money in Antarctica. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So can you just contextualize in the map? Yeah, can I, can I what? Uh, so there was a question asked about the money in a tardy car and Lachlan basically <laughs> said that there is, there is, but it's not legal. It's there is, but there's not legal, but then it's also a broader, <laughs> yep. At, at, but there's also a broader question around the fact that there is money behind these operations that exist. So despite the fact that you live in a world where you don't, you have Antarctic money dollars is still supported by the broader capitalist system yeah getting back to the question the um, resistance in a way <laughs> resistance from the community to the bike shed um well it's funny because and this i'm talking from my personal experience i've always loved bikes and the first time i went through the bike shed um i just saw white old man and that generated resistance from me and i really wanted to participate i wanted to learn about bikes um and i didn't feel it was a space for me like i did i couldn't see because i didn't see myself there i couldn't imagine myself there and that caused being a migrant woman not having english as a first language only arriving to melbourne i guess that talks about the lack of inclusivity and diversity that if the place is not inclusive, it's not diverse, it's not inclusive. And I felt that, I felt that resistance. Um, and it's funny because the second time I went there, thing was there and I felt safe, as ridiculous as it may sound. And we started having these amazing conversations regarding revolution, anti-capitalism and, and yeah. And I was also doing my urban planning degree and used the bike shed as a case study and started researching on all of these things. So um, I guess it's, it's the agency that each of us have to change the spaces. Um, but because or else there's still this um, status quo. Um, and that's what the bike shed was. And hopefully it's changing. Um, but yeah, that's the resistance that I saw back in the days. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it, it's for the people on the Zoom. Uh, it's and it's the the tension is internal within within the bike shed as an example. It's it's an internal tension between the different players, the different people who want to access the space who don't feel included, but the people who have always been there who um, feel as though it is their obligation to teach others and so it's 
yeah, it, it's interesting to look at the micro politics of the space, how it plays out, how the relations play out, how bodies are kind of engaged in kind of different ways and spaces taken up. And yeah, so it, it's very much, you, you've kind of got to be there to see it happen. And then when it does, it's really interesting to see this tension, yeah. Can I just speak briefly? Yeah. So um, in Beyond Money, of course, I do draw on places mm. with it that don't use money. And for instance, in Australia, before white settlement, before the invasion, we had around 600 groups in Australia and they did not use money, okay? And they negotiated their boundaries and how they used the land with one another as external groups as well as internally without money. Um, and there are numbers of Indigenous groups around the world who still operate largely on that kind of basis. There are also some intentional communities that, you know, internally they have minimal, they're like, uh, you know, um, many families internally don't use money too much, you know, like it's on the basis of need that, that, that people gain things. Um, but they're also in Germany, um, no barter, no exchange uh, communities that developed out of the alter globalization movement. Um, they're the Zapatistas, for instance, um, the Rahava communities, you can see the extent to which they are non monetary. And in the Spanish Civil War and various revolutions, this has always come up. It happened in Russia, it happened in Cuba, that there were massive discussions over how you could do things without money and the ways in which you could plan, you know, because it's all got to do with you either give over to this sort of supposedly objective, in a sense, technology um, to sort it all out. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's actually exchanges between us that are creating that. Um, or we actually consciously, you know, self-organize what our production is. Great. Um, more questions, perhaps? Yes, just wait for the mic. It's coming. Great. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Anastasia, and my question is about scale of exchange community. What do you think how big it could be and what is kind of study behind that? Uh, because also if we talk about like diversity, um, it's not suit like all religion, all people. And um, what do you think about the scale? I'll just talk briefly to that. So um, what I would imagine is, is that we have small communities that are as substantively um, communally or collectively sufficient as possible, um, but did you still actually have an internet so that, um, and you, may, you wouldn't have as many digital gadgets as we have, like people would be more like sharing computers and that kind of thing. But look, imagine without money, you would all share your ideas. So you wouldn't have patents or any of those kind of things. So a lot of things um, would be much more accessible to a larger number of people and a larger diversity of people. And it would not stop communication between cultures. In fact, we could reinvigorate more different languages or being used and all of that kind of thing instead of English being the kind of commercial language. Um, so, in terms of scale, I think that in order to manage sustainability, you need a small community to be la as largely self-sufficient as possible, but then there are things that you're only going to need in terms of a factory or something for greater numbers of people. And so people would be actually networked by people around lakes and over mountains, there'd be numbers of communities that would be networking together over how they manage those areas in similar ways and that kind of thing. So the kind of scale is actually happening tiny and but it's happening large. So people still actually have global interactions and they still help manage things on much wider areas than their own smaller communities. I'm 
deeply unable to answer that question. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard question. Um, yeah, I think just like with the experience of the bike shed, I think it, it depends. I don't know, I, I we had this discussion uh, last week yeah around scaling up with api and it was difficult because the, the uh, we were sort of discussed that the concept of scaling up is kind of capitalist in itself right because it, it, it entails the concept of uh being more economically efficient through this process of scaling up and so maybe what do we say that like maybe the scale the term scaling up isn't appropriate but it's scaling scaling out scaling dispersion, out or scaling dispersion out. Yeah, yeah like these more um, yeah, exactly. So yeah. you kind of clone. Yeah, exactly. And so it's more around, um, I guess, accepting the need for specificity and context and allowing others to develop that, but then how to have those interactions between those yeah, networks between, I think. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one, though, an important question to be asking. Um, I had a question, I guess. Yes. I, I, it strikes me culturally. <gasps> See you, later. See you later. Um, I, it, it strikes me culturally at the moment. I see kind of a, a desire to almost rid ourselves of that transaction. And I think it's kind of perverse in its, in its ubiquity in that we are no longer pulling money out of our pockets. I don't have any money on me as such. I have a phone that very easily just exchanges itself for, but I think there's something that is a bit perverse about what's happening in this kind of relationship with our, our capacity to purchase endless subscriptions to things that just auto renew. So there's not that exchange has been removed. Um, and I think it's, that kind of demonetizing of our exchange for things is done intentionally because it doesn't trigger that moment of like, should I actually purchase this thing? And it also sort of freezes up, like I don't buy anything, you know, like it's when, when do I ever exchange or buy anything? I have this endless stream of things that arrive in my inbox and stuff and I just click and it's there. And uh, yeah, I think it's just a, a question about how intentional is that from, and it's not capitalist, it's it's corporate. Like there's a, there's something that's happened that's, I don't know if capitalism exists anymore. It's almost like it's gone beyond that in a way. I don't know. It's a sort of a rambling thought, but I just don't know. Just com com for continuing that, uh, we might be aiming to wrap up by seven. So we have this little conversation, maybe time for a quick question, mm -hmm. but yeah, <laughs> just sagging that for everyone. Do you want to reply? Um, okay, so maybe we just pass for Lacan for a maybe final question and as soon as well. So we can put the. <laughs> we can also raise both and then we address how we feel like. All right. Yeah, you could veto this question, actually, um, if, it, if it takes more than five minutes to answer. Um, but it was more about um, accountability and uh, how you organize. So even in Zhang's example, um, you can see that there are internal sort of struggles with decision making, the direction that you want to go in. And um, I don't know, it, it kind of triggered a worry in me that if we had societies that were based on feeding ourselves around a collective that is supposed to make functional decisions, um, how can we draw on examples from indigenous groups or communities um, that have robust accountability mechanisms to make sure that everyone is participating? Let's keep formulating on that and hear from the question in people online. Oh. Yeah, um, I was just wondering from your respective positions, what do you think um, the planning system or urban governance could be doing better or differently to support your work 
and generally better support commoning in the city. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, just in just in terms of the um, of examples of how you might organise. Um, in the um, Life Without Money book um, and in a community that I lived in in Australia in the 1990s, um, basically people give a certain amount of time, whether that be 20, 30 or 35 hours a week, okay, and that's contributed and, and you basically have all of the jobs that everyone needs to get done and people go to a kind of general assembly once a week. Um, or they do it through a kind of um, timetabling system, um, volunteer for various things, you're not forced to do things, but everyone realises that, you know, you're going to have to get, everyone's going to have to get up early at some point and feed the chickens, you know, so, you know, after a while you feel guilty and you'll do it kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah, so that's generally, uh, I see it, that you need to, you've got, a, an obligation to the community and in return for that you have the security that all your basic needs are met. Um, I agree really fundamentally like that that the, the biggest issue in running these kind of environments is a timetable is timetabling and everything flows from that um, and one of yeah, yeah the timetabling moment um, and the most corrosive element in all of this is guilt you know and shame and and it is one thing that we've seen happen when people who are in a contra agreement go i haven't done the dishes in ages and <laughs> you kind of and then we'll literally duck any kind of moment for you know to, i don't want to bump into joe this is gonna <laughs> kind of like go why haven't you done the dishes but you realize that it's extremely corrosive to any kind of healthy culture so removing guilt and removing shame and like in a, most first nations or indigenous cultures shame is the is 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 the one thing that is will it's the it's, it's the it's the strongest moment is shame above most anything else um that's yeah no i agree with that there's a interesting book called the history of work by james sussman and they talk about like uh different uh, early early nations people with their governance structures and how shame and guilt is used as a way to, to like I don't want to experience shame and guilt therefore I'm going to do this thing and it's just it's just a different way of looking at life um, as someone with Asian parents it's pretty strong in my life as well sometimes so you know there's 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 a practice experience <laughs> um, and the question about like um, what can urban planning do what can urban planners do in this space I think it, it's hard because a lot of these organizations are new, fresh, and the biggest barrier is like access to capital, access to money, and that often requires grant funding, and that requires a high amount of skill and knowledge to be able to do. And so almost it's like, if you want things to flourish, you should just kind of give people money and trust that they'll do something good with it. And it's a bit of a weird thing because we live in a society where it's like, okay, we need a meritocracy. How can we, how can we judge and make sure that this person will deliver on the metrics that they've uh, been given? But it's kind of like that basis itself is problematic and urban planning sometimes stems from that way of thinking. And so trying to challenge that by actually going, okay, we'll just give you money and you can do what you want with it, I think is a way of showing a different approach to doing things. Um, I mean, I think that um, the biggest thing is like land, like, you know, what you were saying about the bike shed, you only have to pay $100 so a week for it. That's the really big thing. If there could be areas of land that where people are enabled to do these things, you know, experiment with different things, that's probably really key. It's that we actually reappropriate resources from of being monopolized by the one percent kind of thing yeah you want to wrap up with something it's just something that i want to ask wait something that i want to ask you zeng how can we save presto market <laughs> <laughs> that's a great one that's a great one we might leave it at that but <laughs> <laughs> Are you got a political stance. <laughs>
I, uh, as part of my thesis, <laughs> I'm doing research around uh, the Preston Market. Preston Market's being demolished. Uh, we have an Instagram page, we have a website. Um, <laughs> So uh, visit our website and have a look. It's, it's an important issue. Um, it's sort of related more to urban planning and you know, community engagement and places for diversity and, and important kind of factors that go beyond just the economics of development, but more about this space around diversity and ethnicity. But thank you, Nick, for the little plug. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did great uh, message we might close the session and leave the invitation open for people who might want to collaborate in saving the press on market and all these other brilliant causes we have here um i would like to uh say a huge thanks for everyone who show up especially our panel but everyone in the audience in person in the zoom and also say thanks for people supporting us behind the cameras making everything run as smoothly as possible organizing the whole wider event of the festival of urbanism and uh, having us being part of the program as well and just encourage to continue engaging with the event the and joining other panels that are still coming further this week and the next one and the next event will actually be resilience and recovery urbanism in the time of disaster happening tomorrow uh, again here at SiteWorks so if you want to come along uh, start at 5 30 till 7 p.m resilience and recovery thanks everyone have a great night.